welcome to worship this third Sunday of Easter. We will begin with our opening litany from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. The first reading for today is from the book of Acts, chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. Here ends the reading. Our psalm for today is Psalm 116. I love the Lord, who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. Precious in your sight, O Lord, is the death of your servants. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Alleluia. Amen. The second reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 1. If you invoke as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you may have genuine love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. Here ends the reading. The Gospel lesson is from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 24. Now on that same day when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, two disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing them. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem 
who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? while he was opening the scriptures to us. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had made, been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, having heard from the word of God, let us also remember what the word of God did. Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of Having listened to readings from the word of God, let us also remember what that word of God made flesh truly did. In the scope of the universe in our lives, as we hear from Philippians chapter 2. Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, and being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As I was trying to figure out when to film this service, I was thinking about the light. And I knew that if I filmed it in the morning, the light comes from the east and those windows are very bright. And that's wonderful when you're in worship, but on a camera, they can be a little overpowering. So I really thought about coming at night. But then I realized that it kind of fit with the message this morning to have some light overpowering us a little bit that maybe makes it a little harder for us to see. Because that really is the theme of the resurrection stories. That the, the light of Jesus, you might say, is so much it overwhelms their people's senses. They can't really see him. It's kind of the theme of all the stories is that people don't recognize him. Right? Mary Magdalene at the tomb, weeping, thinks he's the gardener. And wants to know where he hid the body. The other uh, people 
when they see Jesus, when we hear about the disciples seeing Jesus, they're locked in a room. Jesus tells them not to be afraid, yet they stay in the room. So Thomas comes, and not having seen the first time and really noticing that nothing has changed with them, is unsure. But it's when he sees those wounds that he truly understands who this is in front of him. You might say those are kind of the stories of the famous people and their experiences of the risen Lord. Today, we hear of the experience of kind of the, maybe the more everyday people, the people who were on the side, who were not part of the core disciples, but who were still followers. And it's a very simple story. There are two of them walking along a road. Now, I have to say, not that recently, uh, not that far back recently, while I was uh, working on this for my devotion, I thought of these two as on their way to a house, to a destination where there would have been a gathering, and they were inviting this stranger in with them. But as I was reading it again closely, it seems that it was just these two, and as they got to their home, wherever it was, they invited Jesus in, and just the three of them had a meal. So this was an experience that was not one that was to the favorites, to the um, famous, or even to a large crowd, but to these two simple people walking down the road. Especially in the ancient world, walking is kind of a metaphor, a way of talking about life. The way you walk is the way you live. And here are these people walking in sadness. And along comes a stranger. Now, that probably wasn't very unusual in those days. And they started talking. But this stranger was different. Not only did he not understand or know about what had happened, but then he started telling them they should have known this makes sense based on the prophets. And that's not usually what a stranger might say to people, but for some reason, what he said amazed them, fascinated them. So as they were getting near their destination, it was night, they invited him in. As good hosts, this stranger who had joined them for the journey, they wanted him to come in and break bread with them. And he did. And doing something very simple, maybe a simple meal of blessing and a breaking of bread and passing it around and eating it. Suddenly in that act, they knew who he was. Their eyes were open. Even though he had been there right beside them, even though they sat there right in front of one another, it wasn't until Jesus did those actions, until they began to break bread and eat, that they finally could see him. Now, what's amazing is that they went back and to tell the disciples, and there were stories that Mary Magdalene had and Peter had, and they had now their own story. But this was a different kind of story. This wasn't just Jesus came up to me, he said my name, or he surprised me, whatever. But this was a story of these people going along their life in sadness. And there, as this stranger was talking about scripture, and then as they broke bread in these actions, their eyes were open and he became known. He was known through these things that he did with and among you know, when it says that uh, the prophets talked about this needed to happen to the Messiah, it's not really what most of us think. Most of us are thinking about prophecies, the kind that might make it in the tabloids, right? So-and-so 300 years ago um, made a prophecy that such and such would happen. I think I saw not too long ago, someone had prophesied that there would be some flu-like virus that would go around the world. And I think they might have said in 2020. But really, I mean, there's a flu that goes around every year. We've been talking that this is a possibility for a long time. And I'm sure there have been hundreds of people who've made predictions all over the place. Um, one of my favorite passages is from uh, this guy, uh, St. Augustine, one of the church fathers. And he's writing about all of the ways that people predict the future. And he says something really interesting. He says, you know, if you predict enough things, enough different ways, eventually you're bound to hit on something. That doesn't make it legitimate. 
So it's not really that Jesus was finding passages and making them fit what happened. So when Jesus and in the early church, when they talk about fulfilling scripture, it's more than that. To fulfill it means that all of this together comes to, to sort of a fulfillment in Jesus, a climax. And so what is being predicted is not so much certain things, but the character of God. That the character of God seen through the prophets is the character of one who would be among us, who would join with us, who would suffer and die for us. Now, if you go back and look at the prophets in that light, it's very different. The prophets are constantly telling the people about what God wants for them, but it's not just a stern, please do this, I told you so, you're being wrong. It is a pleading of someone who cares for them and loves them. The prophets anguish over this. Um, one thing I remember hearing our bishop saying that, you know, people talk about having to be prophetic, but... And so whenever they say something people don't like, they call it prophetic. But in reality, the prophets did not want to say what they were saying. It wasn't that the prophets said, all these people, they're so wrong, I'm going to just show them what's what. And then God told them what to tell them. They didn't want to do this. It was, it was suffering because these were their very neighbors and friends. But they did it. And they were sometimes abused, sometimes they were beaten, and they were thrown out for what they said, but they continued. In fact, you could call that a summary of God's actions throughout all of Scripture. God comes in uh, compassion and love and is rejected. God speaks truth and is pushed aside. God tries to help people see ways that they need to be loving toward each other. And God is thrown out. So finally, in Jesus... When all of this happens to this one man, it is a fulfillment of Scripture. In not just a way of predicting things, but in a way that really fills up to the fullness in showing us the character of God. Now think about this journey of these two people meeting the risen Lord. He's there on their journey. He's there when they break bread. And there's a certain point when all of it comes together that they realize it's Jesus among us. We're all on a journey. Our life is a journey. And there may be times when we hear Scripture opened a certain way. We hear a passage that hits us. We may not always know what it means at the time. We may gather around meals hundreds and hundreds of times. But there may also be those moments in a meal. Those moments when you're gathered together, it might just be two of you. When suddenly the presence of Jesus becomes clear. The presence of Jesus there all along, through all those little glimpses, that at the time just seemed something a little strange, something kind of warming in you, but nothing that made a lot of sense, until it has all come to fulfillment, that realization. In our psalm, there's that passage about God, it, that precious in the sight is the death of God's loved one. And I love the way that a uh, Old Testament professor and scholar and person of faith, the way he talked about that, he said, really the way to think about death is not people being dead, but in the process of death. What it's saying is it very precious to God are those who are dying. God is there with them and caring and loving for them. Because that is that moment when all of those things in the past, all of those Glimpses of scripture, those meals, those times together, that is when all of those things come together and their eyes are opened and they see Jesus. To us, their eyes may close, but to God, they are opened. And they see the risen Lord. It is wonderful. Let us never forget that he is always among us. Amen. Having been blessed and accompanied by Jesus himself, we respond by sharing some of our blessings. Hear these words from 2 Corinthians. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that 
by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Let us share abundantly in all our good works, as those of us who have plenty can help those in need, those of us in health can pray for and help those who are sick and those who care for them. Having shared of what we have, we are called also to pray for one another and for those in need. As you take the time to pray in each of your homes, I encourage you to use the prayer list in our newsletter or to simply write down some names that you are aware of and to offer them up either aloud or silently in your heart. And before we pray, let us hear these words from Philippians, which Paul wrote while he was in jail. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. And now we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as we go forth into the world, into our homes, into our lives, let us remember these words that Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 12. Therefore, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.